now my pleasure to welcome Malcolm Richardson, who's come, um, he's a professor now working with David in Manchester, but he has had a, um, a, a, a fairly global career, um, having got his PhD when I qualified in medicine, which was a little while ago, um, has been working on fungi, and, and is one of the uh, last very few remaining biologists in, I know that there are some other biologists, mycology biologists um, in this audience. Uh, there are very few of them and I'm not so sure that we're actually training um, very, very many up now, but um, many of you know Malcolm, he's, he's been very, very helpful to many of us for many years, wor working through uh, Bristol and, and Glasgow and more latterly in Helsinki, but um, back to Manchester now and most welcome to be there. He's the General Secretary of the International Society of Animal and Human Mycology as well and the Director of the Le Regional Mycology Reference Centre in Manchester. He's going to tell us about the environment. How do I, how can I clean up my environment at home or do I need to? <laughs> That remains to be seen. Jeff, thanks very much for those very kind uh, words of introduction and, and thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to, to speak about a topic which has certainly become very, very dear to me over the last, especially over the last uh, 10 years or so, not only from a biological, mycological point of view, but also from a sort of a building pathology point of view to understand more fully exactly where and why molds grow in indoor environments. And this could be the home, the school, the office and of course the, the hospital facility where as we've heard exposure to moulds such as aspergillus can have catastrophic um, consequences. So I think we can start off um, with a few basic um, points of information before we actually get into the, the sort of the, the management of a mouldy house if I want to use that term. Basically let's, let's just review briefly where can we expect moulds to grow and why. And I think it's very important just for us to understand, especially from the, the patient perspective, that um, as human beings, we inhale about 40 cubic meters of air every 24 hours. And of course, depending on the level of mold contamination in either the outdoor environment or the indoor environment, this, this could actually represent a very high level of exposure and deposition and colonization of the mucosal surfaces of the upper airways and of course, as we've heard, the, the lower alveoli of the lungs. So of course, we, we recognize fully that large um, fungal spores uh, such as these uh, macroconidia of Alton area, these are very common um, spores found in the outdoor environment, especially in sort of damp, damp areas. These, these are enormous structures um, in relation to the, the spores of Aspergillus as we can see in this lower picture here. So spores of this size normally uh, are lodged in the upper airways, in the nasal turbinates, uh, in the sinuses, but we know they're extremely allergenic and can exacerbate uh, conditions like asthma. The much smaller spores, three to four microns in, in diameter um, of Aspergillus uh, species, Aspergillus fumigators are shown in this particular slide as we've be begun to understand during the, the development of this symposium this afternoon, they can be uh, entrapped on and in the mucous um, surfaces of the upper airways. We have various ways in which they can be eliminated uh, from the upper airways, but of course sometimes these mechanisms, these basic me mechanisms can be compromised, so the spores are not eliminated, and for reasons which we're not particularly sure about, but we're beginning to explore, a large number of these spores can actually survive the local immunity in the sinuses and end up in, in the lungs. So I think th th these are important points for us to remember in initially. So um, I've been involved over the last few years with a group of um, respiratory doctors and other specialists in the whole area of, of dampness and, and housing and mold in trying to draw up some guidelines, um, a committee that was convened by the, the WHO. And um, from the, the guidelines which we, or consensus guidelines which we have recently uh, published, and I'll give you the details of that free publication at the end of this presentation. We've, we've come up with some, what of course are very obvious points, but I think it's just worth reminding ourselves uh, uh, the situations where we might expect mold growth 
uh, to occur. So it's obvious, of course, that occupants of damp or moldy buildings, a house or, or the workplace, they're at increased risk of respiratory symptoms. We've, this has been a recurring theme during this um, symposium this afternoon. Respiratory infections and exacerbation of asthma. So it's obvious to many of us, of course, that we have to remediate the dampness. We have to find out why uh, the, the indoor environment is damp and what we can do about it. And that's a, that's a completely different subject, a vast, vast subject. Because we know, and it's been shown categorically, that remediation of, of damp and damp areas, damp buildings, can reduce adverse health outcomes. There is increasingly clinical evidence that exposure to mold increases the risk of allergic alveolitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, and allergic fungal sinusitis. And this um, series of WH guidelines, it's the ended up being a book actually, looks into the epidemiology of all of these conditions where it's thought that mold actually have a significant impact. People who are allergic, they appear to be particularly susceptible to the, the biological and the chemical agents in damp buildings. Let's not forget the actual sort of chemical uh, reasons behind uh, the health impacts of, of living in a damp environment. And as we've heard already, the increasing prevalence of asthma and allergies increases the number of people who are susceptible to the effects of dampness and mold. So these are the conditions that contribute to the health risk. Um, indoor dampness, first of all, it's been calculated but within Europe at least, and I suspect it's the same in the Americas and other parts of the world, uh, that 10 to 50 percent of indoor environments are damp for a whole variety of reasons. And of course, we, we should perhaps define what is, what is dampness. So of course, microorganisms require water to a certain extent for their growth. That's, that's very obvious from the basic experiments you might have done in biology at school, right through to the, the growth of, of uh, masses of mold on wet surfaces that we see after major catastrophes such as flooding. And so I'm just really emphasizing here the major tri important trigger for microbial growth is water. Um, we know that molds can grow on most surfaces, most materials. It's amazing where you'll find molds, surfaces, substrates where you would not expect that there will be um, components that can be utilized by, by uh, microorganisms. But yes, if there's enough moisture, and this can just be relative humidity, not obvious surface moisture, you'll get mold growth. And that includes dirt and dust, as we'll see in a few minutes. Um, and we also know that uh, it's very, very clear that an excess level of microorganisms and their fragments, not just the spore, but the, the fragments of, of molds that can be liberated into the environment and the allergens that can be released and expressed in the in, damp, damp indoor environments, these are potential health hazards. And in many parts of the world, the building regulations, um, we all have to comply with building regulations. They're not um, sufficiently robust enough. They don't emphasize the requirements for preventing and controlling excess moisture and dampness. And I've had the opportunity for the last 10 years or so working in, in Scandinavia. There, uh, the, the building regulations are extremely tight and, uh, and, 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 and very, very rigorous. And, and, and countries like that, which um, because of the extremes of climate, the housing design is, is pretty good compared with, with other parts of the world where perhaps there's not so much control. So a lot of attention is given to how to prevent damp conditions arising. And finally, most uh, moisture, apart from obvious things like leaks through the roof because of, of uh, a rainstorm or flooding, it enters a building in incoming air. Let's not forget that. Or as a result of the occupant's activity, and that's something else which I'll just mention. So I think uh, these are important points to remember. So here we have a diagrammatic. Um, Indoor mold, in, indoor environmental mycologists like myself, we, we, we use a term which is called the water activity, and we know exactly uh, what the water activity of individual mold species is, right down to the, the species level of, the, of the, the genera that we're talking about and the way the impact on health. So we have some molds like um, penicillium, which in certain circumstances can be an 
irritant, not necessarily an allergen. They will grow uh, in conditions where the, the water activity is less than 0.8 and where we have this sort of uh, lower level of, of relative humidity. Molds such as Aspergillus, the various species of Aspergillus, they fall into this sort of inner, not quite the, the center, but uh, this next category of water activities. This represents quite a lot of moisture in a substrate, like a piece of wood or a wall covering, where you would expect to find Aspergillus growing. And then we have um, conditions of near saturation, uh, basically where the material, the building material of whatever sort, is pretty well saturated. And here we might expect to find growth of a mold such as Stachybotrys. And there's a lot of public concern about Stachybotrys. This is the classic toxic mold that you might read about in the newspapers, especially after a serious um, flooding event like um, Hurricane um, Katrina in New Orleans a few years ago, like the floods we've had in the UK um, just before Christmas. Um, there, and unless the, uh, the building is dried out rapidly and that's the way to, to counteract um, the mold growth, then you'll get the growth of molds which require a lot of water activity. Okay, so as far as the UK is concerned, there isn't a lot of data, but uh, a study carried out by the uh, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, which I was part of a few years ago, uh, came up with this report, which was entitled Mold in the Indoor Environment of Dwellings in England. It was really focused on, on, on England. Um, there was visible mold, and I'm talking about not just a little bit of mold around your, your window frame or grouting in the, in the bathroom, but, but pretty gross visible mold was, was apparent in 5.4% uh, of properties tested. And I think that must vary tremendously from one part of the country to another. I suspect in areas like where I'm working at the moment in the northwest of England, um, where you have a, a much higher proportion of, of council property, uh, then I think you'll find a much higher level of, of visible mold. But in areas, other areas of the UK, of England, where there's a much higher degree of owner-occupied property, I think the figure is going to be far, far less. Uh, Stachybotrys was found in 12 homes, and Aspergillus fumigators was found in only two homes. And I just want to um, sort of emphasize this. This has quite a lot of, of bearing on what we've been talking about this afternoon. But the conclusion from this report was that condensation, which is really a reflection of lifestyle of human activity or lack of awareness of the importance of, of reducing condensation plus penetrating dampness, these seem to be the major factors which will promote the, mold, the growth of molds in indoor environments. So just to keep on emphasizing the health effects of indoor mold contamination, yes, we have building-related disorders, sometimes uh, term sick building syndrome, but this can be far beyond just the impact of molds on health. All sorts of factors contribute to this uh, pretty vague term, sick building syndrome. Dampness of mold, uh, mechanisms of illness, we do have a much uh, better understanding of that now as we've heard this afternoon. Uh, you, you've heard something about the, um, the allergy and the immunological aspects of, um, of these diseases, in particular aspergillosis toxicity, infection, and finally, a very controversial subject at the moment, uh, the various volatile organic, organic compounds that molds like Aspergillus and other, other molds can actually release into the indoor environment. We don't know really to what extent these impact on, on human health. Okay, yes, people do live in mouldy houses. And this uh, panel here, this picture here on the left-hand side, I think reflects purely a lifestyle issue where this is the kitchen here through the open door, probably a lot of uh, boiling of vegetables, um, drying clothes with an old-fashioned sort of tumble dryer, a lot of, without venting to the outside, a lot of moist air coming out of the kitchen. Here's the vapor trail, and here are various species of Aspergillus and I suspect Stachybotrys and other molds growing on what becomes a very damp substrate. Wallpaper, a very rich source of cellulose, uh, an ideal preferred substrate for molds like Aspergillus. This, I suspect, is, is partly a, a lifestyle. Well, this is certainly a lifestyle issue here. Not too sure whether this is before or after the party, but we have this nice array here of cans and bottles. Um, but this probably does represent um, a penetra penetrating dampness through an exterior wall, or this could be a basement flat, an apartment, where the dampness has come through from the, the surrounding soil outside without adequate uh, insulation around the outside of the building. 
This, of course, could be the result of, of, a, of a catastrophic flood, and, and it's obvious here that there is a mold problem. So this is what, is what I would define as, as visible mold. This, of course, I think is beyond any sort of simple remediation. This probably is a, a case of uh, ripping the building down, raising the building to the ground, and, and a new build. But I think, again, it's just a very nice example of uh, a wet, moldy house, apartment, whatever, wallpaper peeling off, lots of, of, of Aspergillus penicillium and Metallosporium and other molds growing on the, on the, on the wet wallpaper. <coughs> This is perhaps a more familiar picture in many um, households, in, in, in many sort of institutional bathrooms, uh, where you'll find um, molds such as Altinaria and Cladosporium, Aspergillus, Aspergillus niger, in particular growing on the, on the grouting or the silicon seal that's used around the, the bathtub or the, the hand wash basin. I'm not suggesting this is this hotel here, but this is a five, pictures from a five-star hotel. It's quite interesting. If you go to TripAdvisor, not only do you see all these very, very amusing comments about people's experiences of, of staying in a hotel, and I suspect if you, if you went to TripAdvisor and looked at this hotel, you'll get a complete spectrum of experiences from fantastic down to the staff being rude or whatever. You read this about every hotel in the land, but here, here people are taking pictures, and of course this is an extreme. Um, situation, but again, unacceptable mold growing uh, on the ceiling and I suspect everywhere else in this particular hotel bedroom. How these things get through the various um, in inspections, I, I really um, hate to think. This is a situation which could typically take place in a school, in a house, or um, in an office where you have both an air conditioning unit or in colder climates where you use the air conditioning unit as a heat pump to provide some form of background heating during the colder months. Um, here we have what is basically a very simple ceiling supported uh, air conditioning unit. It wasn't maintained. Uh, we took the cover off and this uh, particular model of air conditioning unit has a water condensate tray which then drains away to the outside. This obviously has not been uh, clean for, for quite a long time, and this has resulted Aspergillus fumigatus with some other um, white, um, unidentifiable molds uh, growing also. So not only um, is this type of unit a fantastic air sampler in, in many ways, it's also a fantastic dispersal mechanism. All fungi have pretty, pretty nice um, dispersal mechanisms, but this is really helping, helping the fungus in this case, probably showering the people, the occupants, uh, or the people working in this particular room with vast numbers of Aspergillus fumigatus spores. What's growing in the wall? What's growing behind the wall? M modern housing techniques, you typically have partition walls, um, they are pretty effective in preventing the um, external elements like rain coming in, but of course if you have um, in a classic situation like a kitchen or a, a bathroom or a shower area, you get leakage through the tiling into the, the chipboard and the other materials that are used um, uh, in modern house construction. And, it, and here we have a lot of, of mold growing in the cavity between two sheets of, um, of chipboard. This is more interesting, and this is now beginning to focus on Aspergillus specifically. This is an interior wall in a house, um, um, quite an old um, wooden, wooden house, but nevertheless a dry uh, environment as far as we could see, very, very little sort of um, residual surface moisture. But um, the complaint was uh, patients with, with asthma, sorry, occupants with asthma living in this particular house were concerned about um, indoor mold issues. And to our surprise here, once we've taken off the, um, uh, the chiprock uh, wall boarding, here we have Aspergillus fumigatus. This pigmentation here is classic of Aspergillus fumigatus growing on this what appeared to be a dry wooden surface. Okay, maybe then it, the, the spore dispersal uh, mechanisms are contained within the cavity, but it's a potential source of Aspergillus in the indoor environment. And I'm going to stress this time and time again, in my experience anyway, analyzing a lot of of indoor environments over the years, it's very rare to find Aspergillus fumigatus in indoor environments with the exception of hospital buildings. 
So scraping away from that type of, uh, of situation here, you can, you can remove bits of material, uh, you can cut away or shave bits of wood off, you can, you can analyze any building material you want to think of. So this would be a sort of a pretty complex plate, which would have to be analyzed very carefully, uh, separating the organisms, uh, and some of which you can't identify by morphological means. You may have to use molecular sequencing uh, to actually identify some of these, these molds. The one thing which we are sure about, um, thinking about the indoor environment, the one substrate where you will find Aspergillus fumigatus, it's an interesting um, growth uh, uh, substrate for Aspergillus, is dust. Now, of course, no matter how careful you clean your house, no matter how um, religious you are about minimizing the amount of dust, you'll always find dust. It's, and what is dust? It's a mixture of, of hair, of skin scales from, from the occupant's skin, um, fabric um, particles, and so on and so on. It's a real mixture. But the key point is dust becomes hygroscopic. It absorbs moisture from the surrounding air. So it, moisture, a relative humidity greater than, say, 20%, and that's normally the very, very low level in houses, uh, you'll get a lot of moisture um, in this type of matrix. And then aspergillus will grow and then, of course, goes through the life cycle, dispersing a lot of spores into the, into the room where uh, dust is found. So that's the background. How do we, how do we actually um, remediate this sort of problem? How do we try and avoid, first of all, exposure? And secondly, how can we improve the, the buildings that we're living and working in? Of course, it's um, our responsibility as occupants, and I think to a certain extent it's the responsibility from an occupational health point of view of the people who manage a building, if that's appropriate, or, or where you work. You have to provide a, a, a healthy uh, and safe environment for workers and for occupants. So this could be a school, an office, a hospital building, and of course, houses. The whole, the whole process has to be documented if you're going to try and pursue any sort of claim or issue against a landlord or um, uh, uh, the uh, employer. You have to document uh, the condition and the work which you might think has been carried out which may contribute to the problem, the ingress of water and the creation of a damp environment. You have to try and con control the containment um, at its source, minimizing uh, water ingress minimizing dampness. Of course, you want to try and remove the contamination, source removal. Sometimes this is easy. In other cases, this is a very difficult thing to achieve, especially as a private uh, house owner. It costs a, a lot of money to have your building um, risk assessed and the, um, and the part of the building which is a problem removed and, and, and repaired. But behind all of this, it's still correcting the, the moisture problem to prevent recontamination. There's no point in spending thousands of euros on having part of your property repaired if the basic problem of, of dampness uh, has not been um, sorted out. You'll just get recontamination. You cannot avoid recontamination unless the structures are dry. So the principles of, of remediation and cleaning are very simple. Uh, health and safety, document the project, um, containment control, uh, contain, uh, contaminant removal. And we'll come on to that in a minute when we talk about contents of the house, not just the, the property itself, and um, trying to prevent contamination and identifying the moisture source. So uh, some learning points, both from this um, document, this consensus document I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. This is uh, actually a book called Dampness and Mold. This is the WHO uh, document here. You can download it for free from the, uh, from the internet. Uh, there is a link at the end of my talk. It's a rather long link, but if you go into the WHO website and do a search term under Dampness and Mold, you immediately come up with this, um, with this book, which you can download as a PDF and then print off. Um, also, within the UK anyway, there's a wonderful series of books all about uh, dampness, understanding dampness. Um, this is a book I've been con involved in called um, Remediating Damp, and they're published by the Royal Institute of Chartered Affairs. Of course, they have an online um, web uh, book, bookstore for you to order these books. They're not, they're not particularly expensive. So, the learning points, I think, are, uh, <clears throat> in my opinion anyway, um, 
a source of advice. There are very few reference standards, and that, that applies, certainly applies to the UK. There are no, surprisingly, no reference standards whatsoever. Uh, there are very few reference standards in the hospital environment, but actually none whatsoever for private houses or for the workplace. Um, with one exception, globally, uh, the United States EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, they do have pretty good um, standards, so you can go to the EPA site. There's a lot of very useful information about dampness and mold on that particular website, and that also applies to a certain extent to the CDC website as well. Um, it's very clear that mold growth results from a moisture imbalance in air or the building materials. Solve the damp problem. There's little point in spending resources on a thorough cleanup if the mold will soon return, and that's a very typical scenario. And I would suggest, even though it's a, sometimes a rather difficult subject to mention to occupants when they ask you, what should I do? Classically, when I go to a, a problem um, building, at the request of one of our chest physicians, for example, uh, invariably the house is very uh, dirty, it's very untidy, and, and it's really a lifestyle issue. So thorough, deep dusting and cleaning is always my advice. And in many cases, if the house is dry, it sorts the problem out to a certain extent. So in terms of deep of, of structural cleaning, now we get into sort of perhaps the, uh, the construction side of things. You want to leave the surface clean and dry. You want to re remove any porous materials. And of course, a lot of building materials are porous. Just think about wallboarding and various um, types of wood which are used for interior um, structures. Um, in some countries, and there are a lot of companies that offer this, the, the use of ozone or UV light is, is, is not uh, recommended, and you'll see that exemplified on the US uh, EPA site about um, a discussion about the use of ozone. These um, ozone especially just gets rid of odors. It does not kill mold spores. Remove all dust and debris, um, of, of course, work outwards from the clean areas towards the contaminated area. And, of course, in parts of the world where um, forced air ventilation is, is mandatory, and that's a, a classic situation in, in Scandinavia, for example, that make sure they're functioning efficiently and, and well-maintained. Perhaps the best method from a, a practical home point of view Forget all the chemicals. You can, there are hundreds of, of biocides which you can buy from do-it-yourself stores. The best way of, of, of killing surface mold, at least, is steam cleaning. And here we have a professional company that, uh, that has branches without, uh, uh, throughout um, Scandinavia and in the UK, for example, and of course in other parts of the world like the US, there are very similar companies. Um, steam cleaning, um, basically using a, a larger version of the sort of steam cleaner you would use for your own home is extremely efficient. It, it releases a high pressure steam onto surface mold like this and then you can do all the usual controls by doing contact uh, surface uh, cultures afterwards. Um, you'll find this method extremely effective. And on a much larger scale in, in Denmark, for example, where I took these photographs, whole school buildings were being steam cleaned because of, of mold growing in the, in the ceiling void. Um, as a result of a very high relative humidity in the, in the building. The other issue, of course, is, is ventilation. And um, <clears throat> in fact, somebody did email me, knowing I was going to give this talk, could I just uh, mention something briefly about ventilation? Of course, ventilation is a whole topic. People make careers out of, of uh, studying ventilation, designing ventilation. It's a very big issue. Perhaps not so much in the house, but in, in the larger sort of office buildings and, of course, in the hospitals. But here we have the classic sorts of situations. This is outgoing air here and um, even in my own building, and I, I would dare to say even in my own laboratory, we have vents like this which are covered in dust which are uh, heavily contaminated with molds. And then we have various grills and vents. Again, they become dusty, and for reasons I've explained, you'll find molds growing in, in the dust in these sorts of, of uh, both incoming air and, and outgoing air as well. So we have to monitor ven ventilation. This is so important. Um, if ventilation is repaired and the filters are cleaned uh, efficiently and perhaps they're upgraded, uh, have the occupiers um, experienced improved health, 
Uh, they notice an improvement in the air quality. That's quite a vague sort of concept, but people know if they're living in a, a house with, with improved air quality. Has there been lo less condensation, less condensation on the windows, less damp walls? Um, is there less or indeed any fresh mold growth? This is a very good surrogate marker of indoor air quality and ventilation efficiency. Uh, is the RH now at an acceptable level? You can buy very cheap uh, relative humidity monitors. Um, can you achieve room temperatures um, satisfactorily? And does the air smell fresh? Quite often if I go into a moldy house, it's obvious from the word go that you're entering into a, mo a moldy house. You don't need expensive monitors or uh, in some countries they use uh, dogs which are trained to detect mold. Your nose is a very good sensor for a moldy environment. And then you can use various tests, laboratory tests. Uh, there are companies which offer a test like this. It's a test which will detect a specific enzyme that's found in the cell wall of molds like Aspergillus simply be after the steam cleaning process, for example, simply rubbing a, a swab uh, using this sort of template. So you are, you're sampling a defined area. This can be an on-site test. It only takes 15 minutes to do. If you get a color change in, in an in a enzymatic test, this will tell you whether or not uh, the area is still contaminated. And there are, there are many companies offering this sort of service. Briefly about contents, of course, a very rare book like this is probably beyond repair. Probably every leaf of this uh, ancient rare book is, is contaminated. But of course, um, in flooding situations, your, your, li your own library can be very severely damaged due to flood water. And I think here, this is probably beyond uh, remediation. I don't think there's any point in, in uh, trying to clean a sofa that's heavily contaminated like that, because you, as you can see, the whole room is heavily contaminated. So I think everything is thrown out. You strip back the wall to the, the basic structures and you, you start again. So um, I'm often, I'm just giving you one or two pointers about contents because this is a very frequent question. Should we throw all the clothes out? Should we throw all the furniture out if there's a hint of molds? Um, we can use HEPA, now you can buy very good vacuum cleaners with HEPA filters, of course. There are a whole variety of liquid-based methods. And this list is taken both from UK recommendations and from uh, appropriate authorities in the United States. You can immerse various contents with, with the appropriate biocides. You can use ultrasonic methods, damp wiping with something like um, sodium by um, um, hypochlorite, bleach, steam cleaning, as I've demonstrated. Uh, you can just clean without using water-based uh, liquid um, solutions and high pressure washing. All of these, they have a, a role to play depending on the level of contamination. And then, of course, um, sanding, brushing, or scraping if you're really, really trying to eradicate mold from, uh, from timber structures, for example. So to monitor the cleanup, it's all very well spending a lot of money on removing um, indoor molds from various uh, surfaces and substrates, but you really need to, I think, uh, use a professional company or in the UK where there are a few laboratories like mine which will offer this uh, particular service. Uh, you can do air sampling. Is there still a high level of aspergillus spores or other mold spores in the environment? You can do surface sampling with very simple contact plates. Earlier on, there was the, the comment made about um, the gravity sedimentation plates. Yes, they, they, are, they are useful, um, but they have to be left for quite a long time. These sorts of approaches are sort of almost like point of care tests, which can be done within, say, a half an hour sampling time. And, and then there was the enzymatic test, the so-called micrometer test, which is available both here in Europe and in the United States. You can take dust uh, samples and analyze them both by molecular methods and by conventional mycological techniques techniques, but also behind all of this to measure the, the amount of moisture that's there after the, the catastrophic event and then the cleanup. So this is the sort of air sampler we use. There are um, many of these on the market. There's an impact sampler. This would be a, a very scary situation where we have over 1,300 canidia spores of Aspergillus fumigatus in an indoor environment. That would require immediate investigation. This would be a very, very hazardous, risky environment for um, a compromised patient, for example, to be living in. So we end up with the WH guidelines, just to re-emphasize, finally, some points I've made during my lecture, that we have to try and remediate persistent dampness. 
uh, it's very, very clear that there is a relationship between dampness, exposure, and health. Difficult to quantify, but nevertheless, quite a clear relationship. And the, but unfortunately, there are no health-based guidelines. You're, in the WHO document, there's not a single figure mentioned, a certain level of canidia per cubic meters of air. We use these to a great extent in the hospital environment, but in the indoor environment, in a house or in an office, uh, everybody avoids what is a, a background level, acceptable level. Um, we should try and prevent all of these problems. Um, of course, a lot of attention has to be given and is being given with well-designed buildings, homes and offices. This is critical to try and uh, reduce the level of mold exposure. And of course, building owners are responsible for providing a healthy, healthy living environment free of excess um, moisture and mold. Very, very difficult to achieve depending on the age of the building. Uh, but you as occupants, you are certainly responsible, especially thinking of your own health, for managing the use of water, the way in which you, you cook, for example, the heating system you have, pay great attention to ventilation if that's appropriate in your house, and the various appliances. You're trying to reduce the occurrence of dampness and consequently mold. So there are other sources of aspergillus, just to finish off, of course, it's not just the, the building. I would guarantee that any of you who had a cup of tea this morning would have drunk a viable spores of, of aspergillus. Here we have three um, tea bags, simply cut open, sprinkle the leaves, the contents sprinkled onto laboratory culture plates, a mixture of Aspergillus fumigatus, Niger, and in the, the lower um, plates here, Aspergillus flavors as well. Possibly from student days, definitely my student days, bread and fruit left for too long, in, in, the, in the kitchen would end up with this uh, mixture of molds here. This could be mucor or pin mold. This, I would suspect, is, is a mold like Aspergillus fumigatus. And we know that black pepper in particular, spices like black pepper, are heavily contaminated with Aspergillus. These may not have a, a big impact if you have mild disease, but if you're an immunocompromised patient, perhaps these are foods to avoid. And it's in the air. Here we have um, typical sort of cooling fans. Um, the blades behind the, um, the guard here, you might just see this sort of brown deposit. This is dust full of a variety of molds. And, and again, the, the classic sort of vent situation here. So proper cleaning of all of these appliances, which are to do with air control. And we've heard a little bit about this already in terms of, of, of mulching and, and outdoor activities. So the point is you'll find a lot more aspergillus in the outdoor environment, just naturally because of it, the way it grows on vegetation, but also the, the scattering of, of uh, bark chips that have been cases reported of immunocompetent patients being um, affected by aspergillus growing in what is a wonderful environment. This becomes extremely hot if the bag isn't opened. And don't forget that molds like aspergillus fumigators can grow pretty close to 50 degrees Celsius. And that is certainly the environment in the middle of this, of this composting heap here. And we can see the steam coming off. So I think this is an absolute no-no in terms of, of gardening if you're at risk from um, the consequences of inhaling large numbers of Aspergillus canidia. So this is not a bestseller because it's free, and this is just really to make the point. And of course, this is a, a horrible um, link to, to write down, but nevertheless, it will be on this slide. And I say you can easily get, get this uh, book and download it, but I, if you're interested and concerned, then this is, I would suggest, the book to read at the moment. And it really follows on from what was published in in North America um, in 2004, the Institutes of Medicine uh, published a very, uh, very useful book called uh, Damp Indoor Spaces and Mold. This really follows on from that uh, very useful publication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> so are there any questions for Malcolm? Um, if somebody has, say, allergic pulmonary aspergillosis and they live in the countryside, would you, would you avoid them to move away from the country environment or avoid gardening or pets or, that's three questions. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we, we've discussed the pet one, I think, and I think, but I think right. behind all of that is the answer is, is no. I don't think you can avoid, um, even in um, sort of uh, residential areas, there's, a, there's enough vegetation there for aspergillus and other moles to grow on. So I, I think you just cannot avoid exposure. What I'm trying to say is, is trying to avoid environments, niche environments, where we know there's going to be a tremendous count dispersal of aspergillus, like the composting. Yes. But um, going beyond just the sort of the simple compost in your own garden, there, there, there is concern and about these industrial composting plants. So where you're scaling up the, the small garden composting facility to an enormous operation, yes. then I think you'll get, and, and, and there are situations where there's a village close by to one of these facilities. Of course, the occupants are, are very, very concerned. The middle what? one was, well, we mentioned the pets. There was another, there was a third element to your, your question there. But. Well, it, it, should you move away from a countryside yeah. environment if you... I don't think we generally uh, recommend that. I think what we're doing, and, I, and certainly the case in, in other hospitals um, in Manchester now, I think we're probing a little bit more about where people live and on questioning if there is if there is visible mold then they, they send samples to us if it's in the close proximity to our our hospital then we would go and visit but um, where I used to work in in Helsinki um, there was a mold um, specialist attached to the allergy clinics who would go out and, and sample the environments where people lived and worked I was impressed by how few houses actually had aspergillus yes. fumigators in air sampling of your 1,200. That was, was quite, a, that was quite a, uh, an interesting revelation to me yeah. as well. I find that when I'm testing in hospital environments, it's, it's very uh, it's sporadic and wholly unpredictable where yeah. you find the spores. Um, but that raises a very good question. Why this big difference between, as, as we'll hear during this conference, you know, where in outbreak situations, yes, they have found high numbers of spores, but that doesn't seem to be reflected in the home. Is it a purely a difference, better ventilation, uh, greater attention is, um, why is it sometimes during a construction or a demolition situation, you do find a lot of aspergillus in, in hospitals? Well, I, I had a, a hypothesis that actually the exposure of the leukemia patients mm -hmm. to aspergillus was relatively constant, but that when they knocked down the hospital across the road, that actually they would have been exposed to a lot of dust as well. And I had a sort of hypothesis that you needed perhaps to inhale grit or uh, dust in, or, in order to enhance this process which, which begins in the lung. But it was entirely a, a thought of mine and not, um, uh, it never been uh, tested and, and, and we don't know whether it's important or not. But I think you've raised some quite interesting points. I think, uh, especially during construction, you'll get a lot of aspergillus associated with the topsoil that's removed during the initial uh, phases of laying the foundations and removing a lot of soil. But, but but when you knock down a wall inside yeah. a hospital, the levels go up. So there's something, what is that about? There the must be, it must be a sort of substrate specificity. There must be something about the materials, whether it's sort of a, it's been a chronic steam leak, a chronic sort of a moisture accumulation in conjunction with, with substrates that support aspergillus. Right. But it's a very interesting finding. Yeah. Two questions. Excellent. Sir. Um, one suggestion with regard to uh, harvesting your fumigatus. Uh, I believe that there's some literature suggesting that a temperature of 35 degrees or higher when you're culturing it may increase the yield substantially. And if you go at room temperatures, you may not find it. Y yes. I mean, in the laboratory, we, we use that, that, uh, that knowledge in many ways to, to cut out any sort of other, uh, other yeast and, and environmental fungi if we only want to recover aspergillus fumigators. And we know, as I said, it grows up pretty close to 49, 50 degrees. So that's a device that we use, whether or not growing at that higher temperature actually sort of um, promotes, enhances the recovery of, of aspergillus. It possibly does from a human respiratory secretion, but whether 
um, th that would actually apply to simply um, uh, culturing materials or dust or whatever uh, from a from a mouldy house. I, actually, I don't know. We we typically um, grow all our uh, culture, all our environmental samples at, at 30 degrees to give all the moulds a chance to grow. And we know that aspergillus will grow. You know, they have quite a quite a broad range of of, of, of temperature requirements. And then a question there. Malcolm, I just wondered, is there any particular risk to um, people susceptible to aspergillus from the, the ventilation within a car? You know, when they're driving along and you put the blower on, is there a particular risk in that? There's, there's quite a literature, especially if you don't clean out the, um, the various sort of ventilation tubes, you've got, you've got rotting leaves. You know, think of what a leaf is. It's, it's lignin plus cellulose, so you'll get aspergillus growth on, on leaves. Of course, you can't clean out the whole system, especially in modern cars. That's quite, that's quite difficult. But yes, there is, there is, there is a perceived risk anyway. And the same applies to, um, and this becomes a, a, a bit more touchy because um, I've tried it, is to get inside aircraft and to monitor for aspergillus in aircraft. But the airlines are not that keen on you uh, giving you permission. It's pretty difficult to get permission to go into a airport facilities. I've tried. Uh, you have to make a very strong case or, or it has to be an occupational health issue before the airport uh, managing uh, companies are keen to let you in. So it's virtually impossible to get into a... It, can you catch it from other people? Not <laughs> aspergillus. The, there's a hint. There's a hint in the literature, but actually I think the answer is no. Um, but when you look at some... This is quite interesting. We, we, David and I and others... Uh, we, we, I now have the wonderful opportunity of, of working with a large group of people with similar interests and it's, it's a very dynamic um, type of, of environment to work in. But I think when you look at histopathology pictures of, um, of various forms of upper airways aspects, you, you do see sporing heads, you do see canidia. Now whether they're actually liberated, released, that's, that's a very, very good question. But if you think, well, what is the minimum effective, what is the minimum effective dose is it one spore or a million? It's only one spore that uh, is required to infect somebody who's profoundly immunocompromised, I suppose, in theory. Or if somebody really sneezes and they've got quite a lot of, you know, an aspergillus biofilm or they've got a lot of colonization of the, of the sinuses, I suppose it's, it's possible. I just wanted the, uh, maybe an answer, more answer about the pets. Because all what you said about how to clean the home, makes, uh, I imagine, the patient become very completely discouraged because it looks like it's impossible to get out of, to, to uh, clean a, a home or an environment uh, from the asperges and it's coming always, it's like a Sisyph meat. <laughs> it looks, so at that, this point, as we know that for patients maybe the relation with the domestic, uh, with pets, can be very good for psychological uh, sustain. I, I, would know, I, I would like to know if putting pets in houses, in the home, if, if they uh, increase really a lot the, risk, the, the uh, concentration of asperges or not, because they are walking in the herd or, for, or do they have more in their hair. This, I did not get a really answer about that. Well, there are, it's, a, it's a very interesting point, of course, and there are many ways of looking at this. Yes, you, could, you, could, you, would, you might expect that uh, dogs, for example, perhaps more than cats, um, running through the forest, the undergrowth, uh, would be covered in, in molds. Um, cats, to a lesser extent, and other, other household pets who don't go outside. I think it's highly unlikely that a, that a, a caged mouse, would, uh, the fur would become... Uh, contaminated with, with aspergillus. It's possible, of course. But another way of thinking about this, um, we know that uh, long-nosed breeds of dogs, like, like the German shepherd dog, for example, there's canine aspergillosis, and a proportion of those animals do get um, uh, pretty severe. They, they get epistaxis and, and so on and so on. But it's not that common when you think of how many dogs there are and how many dogs are running through uh, the undergrowth on a Sunday afternoon walk. Um, we're not too sure exactly why 
what, apart from the anatomy of these long-nosed breeds, what else there is about the dog which actually makes them predisposed to canine aspergillosis. Aspergillosis in the, in the cat, for example, is much rarer. In fact, we're involved in Manchester with a case at the moment of, of sort of aspergillus sinusitis, um, by aspergillus fumigators, as it turned out. Um, that, that's a very rare, and the, the referring uh, veterinary surgeon uh, to us um, has looked into this and can find hardly any literature about cats getting invasive asp or aspergillus sinusitis. So I think it's highly, highly unlikely that basically dogs or pets would be a source. But if we start talking about house plants, potted plants, that's another issue. I think if there's any concern about health risks from mold, then perhaps, you know, tubs and tubs of, of house plants is not, perhaps not such a good idea. But Pets, I don't, unless anybody else has a sort of a more insight into the, the veterinary literature or the, the transmission from a, um, a pet. I think there might be a difference between dogs and cats, which may uh, shed fur and uh, allergens and make the house slightly more difficult to clean, but not very, a very big impact between those and, for example, guinea pigs or rabbits, uh, where there's, fur, there's a lot of um, straw and hay as part of their bedding. And the children, if there's children, you know, enjoy playing with the rabbit and want to clean the, the cage out. And it may be that that environment is not good for a child with CGD and cystic fibrosis and, and so on. So I think there might be a distinction between different mm. sorts of pets. <coughs> It is a pet or no pet. Well, but I think the talks have been very, very, um, very good, and I hope that you'll feel that they are um, quite useful for lay people to um, to help them with their understanding of very as various aspects of aspergillosis. Just to very, very quickly iterate what we heard. First of all, Rick um, talked about. Um, uh, aspergillosis and cystic fibrosis. It's a single gene defect with um, quite serious anatomical uh, problems within the lung and uh, these mu this mucus tends to get colonized with aspergillus, especially now that patients are fantastically living much longer, um, probably due to very good antibacterial um, treatment. And then there was that terrific contrast with chronic granulomatous disease where the neutrophils, the white cells, don't work to kill bacteria. They all crowd, bacteria and fungi, they all crowd around the microorganisms, but they're simply unable to kill. So the hypothesis there uh, from Dr. Siegel is that, of course, the organisms are inhaled and they have the potential to invade almost immediately. Whereas in the cystic fibrosis, the, the organism colonizes the airways and then seems to flourish at times when the patient is particularly unwell. So the, the two stories are really an amazing contrast. And then thirdly, uh, we heard about chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, which is an, yet another aspect uh, of this disease, a rather specialized and unusual disease of fungi, start, often starting in cavities, uh, which, as I've discussed with David recently, probably are occurring less and less often in our, um, in our society of managing tuberculosis. We don't really see so much uh, late cavitatory disease now as we used to, but nevertheless, there's still plenty of it around, plenty of colonization with aspergillus, and then the accompaniment of invasion, uh, which requires um, aggressive treatment, uh, be it antimicrobial um, or surgery. And then uh, Marta gave an excellent talk about um, why diagnosis is so difficult in severely immunocompromised patients. Culture is, uh, is, is very poor. Early empirical therapy obviously prevents disease and saves lives. Um, and uh, prophylaxis has had a, a big effect on these. But I always say that um, if you give a hemo, hematology oncologist uh, a little bit of extra time, they'll just increase the immunosuppression. And that is exactly what happens whenever they have something which is really helpful, like a good antibiotic or uh, colony stimulating factors. They just, they just give the patients more and more. 
So then after the coffee break, we were talking a little bit about treatment, and uh, Russell Lewis gave us a uh, really, really clear exposition about steroids and uh, how bodies d deal with the drugs, especially those cleared in the liver. And he really said that fungi are man. Man are fungi. We are fungi. We like fungi. We like cheese. We like, in, in our everyday lives, we love fungi. But a very few people, are, some people are made terribly, terribly sick by these environmental fungi. And uh, there, there is this sort of interesting concept of the cytochromes being similar in fungi and in, in your liver cells. In other words, the, the, the cells which get rid of the antifungals um, uh, are also those which are perhaps the targets for the antifungals in, in the fungi. So, and then, of course, uh, David then also talked about um, getting the antifungal drug levels right. So that paralleled uh, Russell's presentation. And between them, um, we had Gil, uh, Gilbert, who was talking to us about surgery. It's a subject which not many of us know very much about at all because it is so specialized to the surgeon. Uh, but um, it, it's, a, it's, it's clearly not in certain patients' benefit, and it must be so difficult to define those patients. And um, it, it, it was interesting to me to hear about the rather imaginative use of what I would consider to be old surgical techniques. And uh, clearly, in some patients, surgery is going to be dangerous. In others, it's going to be of relatively low risk and huge benefit. And it's clear that you have to have a, a, an excellent surgeon and a good multidisciplinary team to decide uh, when it is suitable to do it or not. So, and, and then David was talking about the variability in handling of these triazole anti antifungals, and it really is interesting. And clearly, uh, for the patients, the, the, the way in which their drugs are taken and monitored is very, very, very important to, to ensuring that the drugs are going to have their best effect. And finally, Malcolm gave a fantastic talk about the environment, and the message to take away is damp and dust. Thank you. <laughs>